Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Podcast, where the DR stands for Driving Results. Our focus is weekly conversations around life and business relationships and the important leadership qualities for both. These concepts and qualities will help you drive positive results in both your business and personal lives. A weekly connection point to help business leaders develop individual contributors, managers, and executives on your teams. We also will tie in concepts around family focus and life lessons to help you drive success in your personal life. Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Show. Let's get after it. Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Podcast, week number two, everybody. Hey, Brent Taylor here, Dr. Leadership. The doctor is in. Glad to be back and uh, got some great feedback from the uh, first week's kickoff uh, talking about why a leader and uh, one of the most important pieces of information came from uh, my better half, my wife, and she said, hey, I think you need to add a little bit more on your credibility just to make sure that everybody understands that uh, this is worth your while and a good place to sit and listen uh, to try to pick up some uh, pieces of information, some nuggets as I call them, around leadership, individual contributors, selling in general, life lessons, etc. So I'm going to jump in here and, and, and this is where I get a little uncomfortable because I do consider myself a humble person and uh, try to lead through humility, but I am going to get a little braggadocious on some of the accomplishments I've had and I want to make perfectly clear from the beginning that the reason I have these accomplishments is because I was surrounded by great people, great supporting staff at work, great supporting staff at home, unconditional love, um, empowerment, uh, etc. So when I talk about these things, it's to do nothing more than to set this up that I think I do have um, uh, enough personal kudos and enough experiences and enough a knowledge base that uh, I'm worth your while for 30 minutes a week. I hope uh, I hope you agree with that after I run through a little bit of time here, but uh, we'll just kind of kick it off. So back to the beginning, I said last week, history major coming out of college, I uh, wanted to be a college level history professor for military uh, backgrounds. If sales didn't work out, I always knew sales was going to work out, but just in case the business life didn't come to fruition, that was going to be my, my, my fallback plan. <clears throat> and I really went into my first position thinking, I'll get some experience and uh, and then I'll go get a real job because it wasn't the sexiest sounding thing when it got kicked off, right? I had a buddy's dad who owned a copier dealership. This is 1989, late 89. And uh, he said, why don't you come sell for me? I said, that sounds like, like a great idea. You know, tell me a little bit about it. And he says, well, it's 100% commission and you got to trade in your Z28 and go buy a van, True story. So um, that was not my favorite part of the new endeavor, as you can imagine. But I knew I had to get my uh, my life started, and it wasn't all about fun and games, etc. So I uh, traded in a medium gray metallic Z28, Irox Z28, uh, bad to the bone, 85, 1985. Great car, a lot of fun in that car. If it could talk, I'd still be in jail probably. But uh, traded that in for a burgundy Chevy Astro van. And uh, needed that because I needed to be able to deliver my own equipment. So I jumped into the business uh, working for a great man. Bill Patterson's his name. Uh, taught me more about selling in my six years there uh, than I've probably learned the other 27 years, uh, to be quite frank. Surrounded by a great team of guys and gals that were selling for us too. And uh, it was really a family feel. But uh, I was a direct field rep for about six years. Um, after my first half year, the first full year I was there was rep of the year and three of the five years, uh, full years that I sold there, I was rep of the year. Uh, that was out of like 12 to 15 reps dependent. They had four or five locations all around, uh, the Midwest and, and was very, very fortunate, um, to have a lot of good friendships developed out of that. And a lot of very successful people, um, was fortunate enough. Bill put together a first ever rep of the year trip. And uh, I was able to win that, went down to Jamaica, had a great old time. And uh, that was uh, five wonderful years. Brought the largest transaction down ever in their company's history. Had a small little company called Pella Windows. At that time, it was called Roll Screen. Dislodged Xerox. They'd been a Xerox customer for 30-odd years. Took me 63 appointments. Someday I'll tell that story more holistically. 63 appointments over about two and a half years uh, to get them to pull the trigger and... uh, I then moved them to my current company, 
when I left my first job to get into leadership, which I'll talk about here in a second, but uh, now billing that company, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars a month to this day, labor on site, handling all sorts of technology needs, first uh, response help desk, mail room, print center, uh, marketing services, uh, all sorts of great things there. So great, great experiences at Copy Systems. I was recruited by our uh, one of our top competitors, I'd call it the top competitors at the time, to run their entry level sales teams. So basically, the fax manager and little desktop copiers and printers manager, and went over there, and we grew that team to the top facsimile sales team in the country, in Des Moines, Iowa. Had three absolutely fantastic ladies that just killed it. And we actually outperformed. It was so funny because we're flyover country, right? Little Des Moines, Iowa, don't pay any attention to us. Um, you know, everything's handled on the coast. And I can remember being at the first big trip, uh, again, down in Jamaica. It's funny. It was a great place to go back then. It was cheap for these company trips, et cetera. But, <clears throat> excuse me, down in Jamaica, and they were announcing the number of placements for the quarter. It was a quarter trip, a 90-day trip. And we went on it every quarter for uh, about a year and a half. But they announced West Coast, Los Angeles to San Francisco results, third place. Announced... Northeast, New York, surrounding areas, uh, performance in second place. And then announced little old Des Moines, Iowa, sales team. Three gals and a guy. And we'd outperformed the East and West Coast combined. That was a very humbling experience of a weekend for those people because we did not let that go. We uh, we rubbed that in hard. It was great. But outsold them uh, for three years in a row we did that. I was then fortunate enough because of the great attributes of the team around me, uh, I was offered a promotion to take over the major account sales team and did that for a couple years. That was from uh, like 96 to 98. And then in 98, the production print business really started to take off for people other than Kodak, IBM, and Xerox, which were really the, the big providers. If you walked in, anybody that was doing serious printing had implants and print centers and lots of uh, volume going on in the big insurance companies and financial institutions, et cetera, healthcare. You'd see a Xerox or, or a Kodak box. Sitting there, and, and I was working for a company called Modern Business Systems at that time, which was part of the Alco Standard Holding Company, which became Icon, which was then bought by Rico, my current provider. That's been my journey of company names and what's been on the cards uh, with my titles, et cetera. And they brought on <coughs> the... Uh, Kodak Digimaster platform, which was a major engine. You know, the most expensive piece of equipment I'd ever sold before was about $30,000. And uh, this product came in and it was $300,000 a pop. And we brought that on nationwide. And uh, my team were the first when I moved into the uh, production systems manager role from the major, had the major account role, the color team, color printing team, and then these, uh, this black and white digital communication team. We sold the first two uh, big units to a large uh, racetrack and casino to handle paramutual betting books. Sold them both at retail, dislodged Kodak uh, devices in, the, or excuse me, dislodged Xerox devices with the Kodak Digimaster platform. First two sold in the United States. Again, little old flyover country, Des Moines, Iowa. Um, the thing about Iowans and Midwesterners holistically, not talking about myself here, but incredibly smart incredibly um, uh, blessed with communication skills and incredibly hardworking and uh, outperform out of the Midwest many other big areas that you mentally think of as the, the hot areas in the country time and time again. But just another great story about the team and, and what had come into play there. The next couple of years, we ended up being the top production uh, color production sales team in the country. And I was asked to move to Chicago, Illinois, to, as, as my boss's boss's boss asked, to fix some problems. Chicago has always been one of the largest production uh, placement marketplaces in the country in this business. So Canon, hyper-focus there. Xerox, hyper-focus there. Konica Minolta, hyper-focus there, <coughs> etc. And I was asked to go there because out of 31 marketplaces in the country, they were dead last. They had sold one Digimaster unit, one big black and white printing unit, and about 13 or 14 big color production devices. 
We had sold 135 color production devices in Iowa the year before, compared to Chicago that sold 13. So not saying Iowa is that great, but it's definitely saying Chicago is that bad at that point. And in the next 18 months, and did not make a single team member change. Let me repeat that. The team that was worst in the country sold 14 production devices out of seven people the whole year before. Competitive market. Chicago at that time had 18 Canon dealers. We were selling Canon products. Had six KM dealers. Had Canon Direct, Xerox's largest placement of or footprint in the country. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a tough market. But in 18 months, we went from last to first. We placed 160 color devices. We placed 31 of the big Digimaster black and white units, number one in both number in the country. And again, didn't change a single person. What I was able to do there was create the fellowship that I talked about in episode one. These people had not been given good leadership around believing in some new products that were being launched that we were bringing on that were different than what they had been successful selling in the past. And they didn't believe in the products and they didn't believe in the leaders that were telling them the products were the new wave of the future. And they sat back and almost out of spite, didn't sell a lot. And I remember coming in and they said, well, why would you sell these products? And I said, well, what are you in the business to do? And remember, individual contributors are after a couple things. Recognition and compensation, typically. Freedom. Not having monkeys on their back as far as leaders. Not being micromanaged. Those types of things. But those are typically the items. And I said, you're here for money, right? They said, yeah. And I had asked my team from Iowa, hey, can I share your W-2s from last year when we were number one? Not with your names on it, but can I share your W-2s? They said, sure. I told them what I was going to do with it. And I sat down with this team and I said, uh, so if I could, uh, I went around the room actually and said, you know, what'd you make last year? One person, 80 grand. Next person, 100 grand. Worst year in 10 years, I normally make $130,000, $150,000, you know. Basically had three people sell all the engines the year before and the other four didn't sell anything. So they were real low. They were salary only, you know, 60, 70,000 bucks. And I said, how would you like to earn $250,000 this year? And they said, there's no way. I said, I think there's a way. And they said, I don't believe it. So I pulled out the four W-2s from the other team. And the average was 250. The low was 220. The high was 290. The average was 250. And I said, now you guys can keep picking shit with the chickens and being upset about different products and different services that you got to sell today. Or you can embrace change. Sometimes you got to embrace what you think you hate to move on to the next level. So this team went from first to worst. It wasn't that I had incredible leadership skills suddenly. I'd been in management now for about seven years. This was 2003, so 96, seven years. But I had the ability to get people excited. Good storyteller, typically. That's why I like the podcast idea, right? Pretty good in front of a group. And started going out on calls with them. And taught them that you don't need to have every deal be the rainmaker for the year. Don't try to make the biggest commission you've ever made on every transaction, especially in that competitive market. you got to take some good ones. you got to take some bad ones. you got to take some ugly ones, right? But you got to win to get the ball rolling. It's like three-point shooting. My wife, all-American basketball player, high school and college, one of the best shooters ever. And it's a streak business, just like that. You get a couple going in. If you're a sports fan, you see somebody like Steph Curry. I mean, he throws one good one up. You know the next seven out of nine are going down. It's a streak business, too. Sales is a streak business. Got to strike while the iron's hot. You get a lot of no's, and then you get some yeses in a row. So convince these people to just start getting after it, and they were able to take on some of those changes in their in their mental picture and and away we went. So that allowed me to be the top production manager in the country. And then I was asked to and Chicago's a great town, but man, the traffic sucks. I mean, I was 41 miles from downtown. That was an hour and 45 minutes on a good day. I had an office 57 miles away. If it sprinkled, that was three hours. 
couldn't train every day because you might have to be in a couple offices. It's like being in the Northeast, it's like being in LA, it's like being in Houston, it's like being in Atlanta. You know, traffic eats your life up. And I didn't want to spend my, my life that way. I had young kids. And I was offered the opportunity to come down and run uh, the Carolinas marketplaces as the strategic director of sales. So I'd have all the production reporting to me. I'd have all the managed services that's labor on site. I had about 12 sales teams, 100, 110 reps, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, very, very fortunate to uh, go down and have great leadership there. Had a great gentleman, by the, I'll just call him Ron, that, that brought me on down there. And then another great leader that I've been uh, side by side with for a long time. A uh, gentleman by the name of Bob, that has been very impactful to me too. Came down and loved it in the Carolinas, ran the the Carolina marketplaces for several years, and then at that time I said it was Modern Business Systems, Alco Standard, an icon company, and then we were bought by Rico in two thousand eight. And in two thousand ten, they asked uh, me and a senior leader from the Rico Direct side to build a new marketplace in the Eastern Carolinas because combining the Rico Direct and the Icon teams made the marketplaces so big that it was too much for one leadership team to manage. So built from the ground up an entire marketplace. And then as the company developed and morphed in 2012, they they asked me to uh, go back onto just the production side and lead the Southeast part of the United States and take on a regional position. So it was kind of a natural transition for me very excited about it. Production's always been my bailiwick and my love. <coughs> Excuse me, still fighting over a little, little of the head cold stuff here. But uh, took over the Southeast region. And then in 2013, I was asked to uh, uh, to develop a, at that time, what we called a global production sales team. It's basically the uh, Fortune 1000 largest privately held, um, you know, and then subsidiaries, Berkshire with 200 companies and Amazon with 100 companies and all up and in, you ended up with about, oh, I don't know, 3,500, 4,000 accounts. And started with a dedicated sales team. Hired up six, added two more, went to eight at the end of that year, added 19 more the next year, and then uh, finally seven more to a full uh, full team of 34. And when we developed the program, those accounts had done $40 million in total revenue, not including annuity but hardware, software, professional services the year before and had sold to 200 accounts total out of the 4,000. That's a really small number. That's 5%. Not every account is a customer opportunity for production workflow, production output, production professional services, but not blazing the trail. <coughs> Excuse me. So we uh, built that thing up and grew it by 100% in number of customers we were doing business with and added 50% more revenue in three years. It was an amazing team to be a part of. It wasn't just all about me by any stretch of the imagination, but we got really refined in territory size, which I'm going to cover in a, in a podcast in the future. Smaller territories are good because you dig deep. You find all the morsels. You lift the corners of the rug to find everything in play in those accounts. And you have a smaller number. We had 34 people calling on, let's say, a thousand of the 4,000 customers were viable opportunities for us. We were doing business 400. Suddenly, we had 40% market share from maybe a 10% market share when we started. It was a grand time to be a part of that team. So I ran that for uh, several years. Then in 2018, um, <laughs> they, uh, came to me and asked me to run uh, all the production sales, not just the global side, for the West region. And then uh, shortly after that, the uh, other regional VP left, so I ran the entire country for about uh, eight months. Then ran the East because I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina. It made more sense. They actually asked me to run the West, even though I lived in Charlotte, because it needed such you know some fixing again. I've always kind of been a fixer um, in the company's eyes. And... Took over the East, and then they came to me and created a new position in April of 2021, uh, strategic sales and new business development. That position, excuse me, is focused on all of our national programs inside of RICO today for what's called RICO Graphic Communications. And that is all of our output engines, the biggest engines can be sheet fed, can be continuous feed, 
our data management software, basically any credit card statement you get, any bank statement you get, we're, we're managing the data, getting the output out, making sure your statements are only your statements, going in the envelopes, processing all of those records. Anything you go and get in your mailbox, color print, marketing materials, that stuff's coming out of these, uh, these services that I'm responsible for. Um, also ran all, uh, run all of our federal sales. It's a very, very, um, specific business. So all of the federal agencies we call on cover those, all the inside sales group for uh, Rico graphic communications, all of our franchise relationships and our large commercial print program for the U S so have, uh, you know, a hundred direct reports, uh, several hundred indirect reports and a thousand that I managed through influence today. So just wanted to give a little more backbone on what I do. My wife thought that that was good to add to give me some relevancy for these future conversations. And with the rest of my time today, I want to touch on communications. Communicating with your team, communicating with customers, and some key attributes of that that you need to stay true to to ensure that your communication is effective and concise. The first thing I want to talk about is who in the hell invented the reply to all button. It is amazing to me how many people think I want to hear 120 response, uh, responses of great job to somebody or congratulations to somebody. You know the deal. Somebody blasts out an email. So-and-so has been added to the team and I'm really happy for so-and-so. I don't want to come across as that guy. But why Microsoft Outlook? Why um, Lotus Notes, whoever else, uh, Gmail, whoever else has not required a update on the software that if you select reply to all, you have to agree to a terms and conditions contract that you're about to be a jerk to 120 people. You got to, it, it should be a couple steps you got to do to reply to all. That is a big, big communication no no in my mind is that. You just uh, blast things back to everybody every time someone communicates to you. If I'm on the CC line, I don't need to be continuously added in the back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And in a services business, which I'm in, that has a lot of subject matter experts and team selling, which a lot of businesses are, and any business where you are in need to communicate clearly a, a across important topics, let's say it's real estate and you're talking about um, down payments or you're talking about earnest money or you're talking about contract ads and subtracts or things that you want to stay in the house on your offer, any of those things, about the third time I get a reply to all and with another question and, the, and other questions not being answered, that's when I throw the flag and call the timeout. There's this wonderful device that was invented a long time ago by AGB, right? Alexander Graham, called the telephone. And there are times, believe it or not, when a text and an email are not the appropriate means of communication. And I think you have to look at that as a leader and lead by example. Certain topics that are critical to success, that require a lot of input from different people that are uh, going to impact a customer profoundly or uh, have uh, very important circumstances that need to be met should still be accommodated through a direct conversation. I understand different generational preferences on text, email, phone. I'm not saying you don't utilize all of those tools. What I am saying is that you utilize them in the appropriate spot. You don't argue in text. You don't even have Challenging conversations with your significant, significant other, wife, husband, boyfriend, parents via text because context is lost, details are not included, and it leads to dissatisfaction on everybody's part. Communication, if it's an important scenario, if it's something that's driving business or has a, a, a significant impact on your family or your friends or whatever, make sure it's concise. If you're a salesperson or a leader of salespeople, 
and you're in front of customers, another one I want to make sure everyone understands is do not use your own team's or organization's vernacular. Acronyms. My company, we have a glossary, a thesaurus, a dictionary, an electronic document management warehouse full of the acronyms that we have uh, used and continue to use today. It is imperative that you don't use those acronyms in front of customers because it means nothing to them. When you're talking to a customer or prospect, you need to be communicating in their vernacular. You need to do enough looking into their business before you call on them to understand their pain points, their challenges, etc. If I'm in an insurance call or if I'm in a healthcare call, I'm going to be talking about personal healthcare information and compliance. If I'm in banking and finance, I'm going to be talking about regulatory impacts that they're trying to overcome, where their pain points are. I'm not going to be using my acronyms or my sales team's um, vernacular because it's not going to accommodate the conversation where I want it to go. So be clear, be concise, utilize the customer's vernacular, not your own. Utilize the appropriate means when you do communicate. Text is fine for quick update. What's the update on ABC deal? You're going to hit your forecast. Yes, no answers, those types of things. Tell you a funny story. Texting, when I'm direct on text, just because I'm busy or whatever, with my kids, this was all through high school, all through college. I raised them basically with my, uh, with their stepmother, um, had majority custody and a uh, great relationship with them. But if I answered back with K instead of OK or just an OK, the next text would be, why are you mad at me? <laughs> I'm not mad at anybody. Just busy. No context. So it can be misinterpreted. It can be misread. It can be uh, cause for concern that doesn't need to be cause for concern. So just make sure that you're using the appropriate means of communication. The other thing that's lost is a well-written communication. Use spell check. Read it once before you send it. Learn how to conjugate. If you don't know what conjugate is, look it up. It's an important one. Learn grammatical errors that are common and avoid them. Spell they're there and they are correctly. Those are all really, really important things. You come across as a dummy and not relevant if you blow the little things, okay? As a leader, a manager, if it's a critical item that you need from your team that requires lots of clarification, call a team meeting. I don't like meetings for just having meetings. But I would not send an eight-paragraph email out on this big program I want everybody to put together, or here's what we're going to do with the reviews with the CEO, and I want you to do this, 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 and this, and this, 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 and this, and send a blank template. Here's the PowerPoint document I want you to use. Here's the Excel format I want you to use. That type of communication requires a sit-down and a team meeting. So when you're communicating with your customer, use their vernacular, be very clear, be concise, be able to write proficiently, be able to conjugate, use paragraph indentation. Come on, man. This is the easy one. If it's an internal family matter, make sure that you're using the right resources on that too. Make sure your kids know you aren't mad because you're short in a text. Make sure that context is always ingrained in the conversation in some manner. And you're going to have a lot better success in being effective and getting to the end result that you all want. So this week's podcast, a quick hit on communication, a quick hit on some of the reasons and my communication skills and, and some styles that I used in the past to drive some success and to turn some teams around. I'm very excited about this podcast going on and being in play and looking forward to next week. Remember, love the feedback. You can reach me at drleadershipresults at gmail.com. Would love feedback, positive, uh, critical questions. Hey, what about this? Would love to get some, uh, some, uh, some of the people in the stands giving some input here and uh, leading some of the conversation. And then also remember <clears throat> that the uh, website is www.drleadership.com. You can see some of our other services. We offer some voiceover work. We offer some subscription models for extra content with some great speakers and some other great business leaders. 
uh, involved in some interviews. Check that out. Would love to have you join our club on that. And uh, without any further ado, I'll let you go. And uh, just remember, you're awesome. Keep that shit up.